So today we are going to be talking about um, extending the notion of global temperature to what that means at the local level, at the, lo at the location area, because nobody lives in a global average. Everyone lives at some location on the surface of the planet. So this is the connection between temperature and then a lot of these other impacts that we'll end up seeing is how that, how that global temperature translates uh, to a local temperature. And so there's one thing that, that we should talk about before uh, we get to that. And that's this idea of converting the global average temperature, which is what we mostly have been talking about in all the graphs that I've been showing, converting that to a local uh, temperature. And especially in the United States, we think about temperature in degrees Fahrenheit, not degrees Celsius. So the first thing we have to think about is, is just multiplying what we usually see on these graphs because scientists like to use uh, degrees Celsius. What we, so we should think about first converting degrees Celsius to degrees Fahrenheit. And so that factor is 1.8. Um, if you're actually converting a degree Celsius into degrees Fahrenheit, then you have to subtract that uh, 32 degrees um, from the equation as well. But when we're talking about a change in temperature, it's just that magnitude that we have to worry about. So we're always talking about changes in this class. So um, one degree of warming degrees Celsius would be 1.8 degrees of warming uh, in degrees Fahrenheit. So multiply a change in degrees Celsius by 1.8 to get change in degrees Fahrenheit. So that's the first thing. And then the other thing is that we, as humans and terrestrial ecosystems, live on the land. So we have to multiply actually a global average temperature by another factor to get the average warming over a land location. So multiply global warming by 1.5 to get local warming over land. And so this idea is shown in this, uh, this map here. What this map shows is the ratio of local to global warming. So it's the amount that the location warms divided by the amount that the globe warms. This is calculated by uh, climate models. But if we look at the, um, at the uh, legend down here, we have zero. So anything that is um, below zero would mean that that location cools as the globe warms. And we see we have nothing below zero, right? So that's why it's called global warming. So every location that, we've, that we see is positive. So that means everywhere warms as the globe warms. Um, but then the other important value here is this one value, since this is a ratio. Degrees Celsius per degree Celsius global mean change. So one would be the location, the locations where the local change in temperature is equal to the global change in temperature. And anything below one, so like 0.5, would mean that locally it tends to warm 50% of what the global average is. And then if it's 1.5, that would, that would mean that locally it tends to warm 50% more than the global average. And so what we see is that the oceans tend to be below one. So the oceans warm less than the global average, but the land tends to be above one. And especially the land in the Arctic is like two. So anything that's purple here, that's showing that that location warms like twice as fast as the global average. <clears throat> so on land on average, it's about 1.5. So that's why I have this 1.5 here. And so in San Jose or just any given location, we can think about that we are going to experience about 1.5 times the global average warming. So then we would want to put these two things together to get a more intuitive sense of what global warming means at the local level. So if we multiply 1.8 times 1.5, that equals 2.7. So to convert any given value of global warming in degrees Celsius to a value of local warming in degrees Fahrenheit, we should be multiplying by 2.7. So we've talked a little bit about, you know, right now we're, we're, we have experienced about one degree Celsius 
of global warming since pre-industrial times. And so if we wanted to convert that into something that's more intuitive to us, we would say, okay, most people on the land have experienced about three degrees. So about 2.7 or about three degrees, if we're gonna round to the nearest degree, three degrees of warming um, so far. So that would mean that basically just when you walk outside, all the temperatures that you're experiencing now are about three degrees Fahrenheit warmer than they would have been had we not um, burned, had we, had we not been burning fossil fuels. And so then we can put that on a chart like this or on a graph like this, that's the um, global average temperature from 1850 through 2000, then 2100. So a lot of times our graphs end at the year 2100, but this one um, actually goes on much longer, which is important because we don't expect everything to end in 2100, right? We actually do care about what happens after 2100. So 2100, 2200, 2300. Um, and then these are different emissions scenarios, how much greenhouse gases we actually emit into the atmosphere. So RCP 2.6 would be like a very strong uh, transition to renewable energy and non-carbon fuel uh, energy. And RCP 8.5 would be very high emissions where we go and um, basically burn as much coal as we can and we have very high population growth and high uh, economic growth that's uh, fueled by fossil fuels. So that's our, that's our range. And then this is, this is temperature in degrees Celsius for global mean temperature from 1881 to 2000. So here's our pre-industrial level. So that would be um, zero degrees Fahrenheit over the land. So I'm just gonna convert these values of degrees Celsius into these now more intuitive values, um, which would be our degrees Fahrenheit over land. So here's our starting point pre-industrial Here's where we are in 2020, is right around here. And so we're at around 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit warming over land in 2020, or about three degrees Fahrenheit. Now the Paris Accord goal, uh, which I think I've just mentioned in passing, we might go a little bit more into detail into the Paris Agreement. Um, but that's the goal is to is for the global average temperature to stay below two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. So converting that into degrees Fahrenheit over land, that would be the goal is to stay below 5.4 degrees Fahrenheit warming over land. So now all of a sudden that sounds you know a little bit larger than that two degree uh, figure. And of course, the Paris Accord is a very actually ambitious goal. Uh, if you look at the trajectories for the energy systems, um, it would require a lot of intervention into the global energy systems in order to achieve that goal. And so if we look at you know, current policies on the books, what people are kind of pledging, what different countries and, and uh, large organizations are pledging around the globe, that puts us more at about 8.1 degrees Fahrenheit warming over land uh, by 2100. So that's kind of this, this range right here. So it's about three degrees uh, Celsius. And then we can see um, what four degrees of warming Celsius looks like. So that's like 11 degrees Fahrenheit. And then up to, you know, in the range of 25 degrees Fahrenheit over land by uh, 2300 and you know much more even uh, is a possibility uh, with some models. So these are all calculated from uh, climate models or uh, our physical simulations of our best understanding of the climate system. So start thinking about these goals in degrees Fahrenheit over land because I think that's it gives you a better sense of the amount of warming that we're talking about as opposed to a global average, which is kind of meaningless to any given person. And also a degree Celsius, which we're not used to thinking about uh, in the United States. So just another way of, of looking at that, um, San Jose annual mean 
daily average temperature is about 71 degrees Fahrenheit if you average over the entire uh, year. So this is a chart of daily average temperature in San Jose. Uh, so this is the maximum, the, the daily maximum for that day of the year from January through December. And this is the minimum, uh, the daily minimum. So meaning like in August, we have a, a usual daily high temperature of 82 degrees Fahrenheit and a daily low temperature of 60 degrees Fahrenheit. And in February, we have a daily average of 63 degrees Fahrenheit and a, or a daily average high of 63 degrees Fahrenheit and a daily average low of 47 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and so if you average this daily average high temperature over the course of the year, you get about 71. So we can think about in San Jose, our thermostat is set at about 71 uh, degrees Fahrenheit right now. And so that would mean that in pre-industrial times in San Jose, it would have been about 68 degrees Fahrenheit. And then we can put on the Paris goal here of we're trying to stay below um, an additional couple degrees Fahrenheit, so below 73 degrees Fahrenheit, and then under a, a high emission scenario, we're talking about um, San Jose being closer to like 80 degrees uh, Fahrenheit for the high. And then that would have major implications for like heat waves and a bunch of other things. So this is, this is just to, to think about the, the average temperature. Um, and that doesn't necessarily say anything about how droughts would change or how floods would change or how precipitation would change, um, which is actually where a lot of our concerns about impacts uh, come in. But still, I think it's important to, to have this type of temperature scale in your head as opposed to like one degree Celsius, two degrees Celsius, three degrees Celsius, because that's um, less meaningful. Okay, so with that in mind, let's talk about one of our uh, topics today, um, and that is the velocity of climate change. So the velocity of climate change is how fast you have to move to stay at the same climate. So velocity we can think about is a movement, it's a motion term. Uh, so like miles per hour, feet per day, kilometers per second something with time, with space in the numerator and time in the denominator. Um, so the first thing to, to think about here is that we have a distribution of temperature in our current climate. So that's what this, this is a map of, is global average or the local, it's a map of the, of the average temperature at each location uh, over the globe. And averaged over the entire year. So reds and browns are the warmest locations on earth and the blues are the coldest locations. And you can see our temperature in both degrees Fahrenheit and degrees Celsius. So no surprise that we have the warmest uh, temperatures near the equator. India is very warm, Africa is very warm. The Amazon is very warm, Australia is very warm. These tropical oceans are very warm. And then as you go, north and south away from the equator it gets uh, much colder. And the other thing you notice is that mountains are much colder than um, flat low lying areas. So our Rocky Mountains here are colder. We can see uh, California, the Central Valley, and then um, Sierra Nevada mountain range. We can see the Andes is very cold. We can see the Tibetan Plateau is this very cold extreme uh, location. Uh, the Himalayas are where uh, Mount Everest is. So it's mountains and high latitudes that are the cold locations. And this is, you know, we have to, we have to, in order to get to this idea of the velocity of climate change, we first have to realize that there is a natural gradient in temperature, meaning a change in temperature in space. And so as you go further to the north, it gets colder, right? So we know, we know that. And as you go up, it gets colder. Um, so that's the first ingredient. And then the second ingredient to think about for a velocity of climate change is just the fact that it's warming all over the place. So we have the fact that it gets colder as you go to the north and the fact that it's warming. So this is a map of 
how global temperatures are warming in terms of trends. So I showed this before when I was um, talking, talking about the evidence of human impact on, on climate and how we have this kind of globally uniform increase in temperature. Um, so that's just the other component is that it's warmer to the, so it's warmer to the south, colder to the north, and it's warming all over the place. And okay, so now we want to uh, use those two pieces of information to figure out what we mean by the velocity of climate change. How fast you would have to move to stay at the same temperature or to stay at the same uh, climate. So let's think about it this way. These are gonna be two maps. So it's like we're looking down uh, from space and we're looking at two maps. So we have climate in the year 2000 and climate in the year uh, 2100. And so this is gonna be north, up is north like a regular map and east is to the right like a regular map. And we're gonna put on here what our kind of baseline climate is in the year 2000. So uh, we call these isotherms. This is the same thing as what we're looking at on this slide is just the average temperature of that location. So let's say it's 80 degrees average temperature down here. And then as you go north, it gets colder, right? So you go north, now it's 70 degrees on average in this location, 60 degrees on average in this location, 50 degrees on average in this location. Okay, so now let's also put a, a uh, distance scale on here. So let's say that this is 100 kilometers uh, distance between our 80 degree Fahrenheit average and our 70 degree Fahrenheit average. And 100 kilometers is 62 miles. Okay, so now if we go, if we go back to this one, let's imagine that temperatures at this location warm by 10 degrees Fahrenheit around, which is within our range of what could happen by 2100. So we could see if there is no effort to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, we could see temperatures warm by 10 degrees Fahrenheit by 2100. And so what would that mean? So think about, take a second to think about what does this location look like in terms of temperature? in 2100. So if I put the line on here, what's that line going to say? So if this used to be 80 degrees, we're going to warm that up by 10. So this is now going to be 90 degrees Fahrenheit here. And so what does that mean for the 80 degree line? Where did that go? So if we warm the whole thing by 10 degrees, the 80 degree Fahrenheit line just moved up here, right? So the, the 80 degrees in the previous climate turned into 90 degrees in the next climate in 2100. And then the 70 turned into 80. And then the 60 is going to turn into 70. And then the 50 is going to turn into 60. And so what does that mean in terms of our distance? We can think about, instead of, instead of thinking about it like, OK, each location warms by 10 degrees Fahrenheit, we can also think about it like, the temperature moved in space. So this 80 degree line moved from this location in latitude to a location further north in latitude, right? And all of these lines did that. And so what they actually did is they moved about 100 kilometers or 62 miles. So that would be the answer to this question, which would be the type of question that might be on a test. Uh, how many kilometers do you have to travel to stay at the same temperature? So if you start at this latitude and you have um, a certain amount of time and you want to, like, let's say, let's say you personally really prefer, you know, one temperature or you can imagine certain ecosystems 
in certain uh, organisms really require to be at the exact same temperature, exact same climate. Um, and if they wanted to stay at that climate, they could migrate, they could move, um, in this case, 100 kilometers or 62 miles to stay at that same uh, temperature. So how many kilometers do you have to travel to stay at the same temperature? In this example, it's 100 kilometers. And then how long of a time period is this? Well, it's 100 years. So it was climate in, two, in the year 2000 and climate in the year 2100. So it's 100 years. So then what is our velocity in kilometers per year? So we just take how far we had to go in kilometers and divide it by how many years we had. So our velocity, this is our definition here, the velocity of climate change in this example is one kilometer per year. And then to give a more intuitive um, unit, we can convert that into feet per day, which you can just you know Google that or do the individual um, <clears throat> conversions. And what that turns out to be is nine feet per day. So every single day, an organism uh, would have to move nine feet in order to stay at the same climate. And so that's, you know, that's not a problem for mobile animals necessarily, uh, but it is a problem for trees, right? And so if it's, it can be a big problem for ecosystems because, uh, you know, you have animals that like live in trees and if the tree was able to move, they, they'd be fine. But if a tree is, or a, just kind of an ecosystem in general is sensitive to the temperature, it's gonna have a very difficult time uh, migrating at nine feet per day. So here's, that was a, uh, you know, a, a simplified example, but here are some real results for the velocity of climate change. So this is zoomed into uh, California and our Central Valley here. And so this first graph is, or this first map is mean annual temperature. So we see the Central Valley is very hot. Over here, this is Death Valley, right? So that's very hot. Uh, and then it's much colder uh, in the Sierra Nevadas. Um, and then this second graph, the C, is the spatial gradient in degrees Celsius per kilometer. So that means how fast temperature changes as you move in space. And so where it's flat and you're not getting a lot of change in elevation, then your spatial gradient is very small, but it can be very large in mountainous regions, right? So it's like, if I'm sitting in the Central Valley in, in California and I go one mile to my east, you're basically in the exact same climate because you didn't go up or down any mountains. But if you're in a mountainous area, if you're in Yosemite, for example, and you go a mile in one direction, you may go up in elevation by a ton. And if that's the case, then you've changed your temperature by a lot. And so you get these large spatial gradients in temperature in mountainous regions. And that has a direct in impact on how the velocity of climate change will be calculated, right? Because that means that you would have to move a lot less of a distance as it gets warmer in order to stay at the same uh, temperature. So then, so here's our base climate, here's our spatial gradient, how much temperature changes in space as you go in different directions. And then here's our temporal gradient. Temporal means time. So it's the amount of change in temperature per year. And so you're basically multiplying these things together to get your, or you actually divide them. So here's how it, here's how it works. You would take your temporal gradient, degrees Celsius per year, divided by your spatial gradient. So how much is warming divided by how far you'd have to move to stay at the same temperature. Uh, and then you get the speed, the velocity of climate change. So this is your velocity of climate change down here in kilometers per year. And so the, the takeaway here is that flat locations like the Central Valley have much 
higher velocities of climate change. You have to move farther to stay at the same climate if your baseline climate doesn't change very much in space. So just imagine again, like if you're sitting in the Central Valley and it warms everywhere and you're trying to stay at the exact same temperature by moving, you're gonna have to move really far uh, in order to stay at the same temperature. Where if you're sitting on a very steep mountainside where it's much colder, like just within eyesight and it warms everywhere, in order for you to stay at the same temperature, you have to go up the mountain, but it's not that far. You can kind of just, um, you can just move a very a short amount of distance uh, in order to stay at the same temperature um, because there's so much local change in temperature in space, in this spatial gradient uh, here. So this is what the velocity of climate change looks like for the whole world. So this is a uh, logarithmic scale, so it's not linear. So it starts with 0 0.01 kilometers per year in blue, goes to 0 0.1 kilometers per year in light blue, one kilometer per year in yellow, and then 10 kilometers per year in uh, red. And this is how fast you'd have to move. This is kind of a high emissions scenario, kind of like that RCP 8.5 that we saw in the, in the previous uh, diagram. And so, yeah, we see that the, the uh, flat regions show the largest velocities of climate change and the mountainous regions show the smallest velocities of climate change. So 10 kilometers per year, what is that in feet per day? So that's like 90 feet per day. So that's about 10 times faster than the example that we just uh, showed previously. So that's getting um, quite quick and quite difficult for an ecosystem to uh, migrate at speeds like that. So here's, here's the same graph just uh, with these new units on it. So instead of 0 0.01 kilometers per year, that's about one inch per day. So uh, not too difficult. 11 inches per day is 0.1 kilometers per year. Then we're at nine feet per day is one kilometer per year and 90 feet per day is uh, 10 kilometers per year. So just looking, taking this 90 feet per day, putting that into a more understandable perspective, we can think about that in terms of San Jose State's campus. Um, so with a climate change velocity of 90 feet per day, how many days would it take the climate to move the length of Duncan Hall, which is 300 feet long. So here's our satellite Google image map of San Jose State. Here is Duncan Hall. If you just kind of, you know, do the math on this, uh, you will get, it will take 3.3 days to move for the climate to have moved 300 feet. And so this is kind of, this is what we're basically experiencing right now in some locations on earth, that every three days or so, the climate is moving approximately the length of Duncan Hall. And then to put that into perspective for the entire San Jose State campus, it's about 23.3 days. So again, this is, this is not necessarily for San Jose. This is, this is for these most extreme locations on earth, 90 feet per day locations. So kind of the flattest locations um, in Canada and the United States and uh, in Russia. So these locations, it's like every 23 days, the climate has moved an entire length of San Jose State's campus. And again, if it's, uh, if you're talking about an uh, ecosystem or an organism that's not very sensitive to temperature, that doesn't matter very much. But if it is sensitive to temperature, and especially if it's like a plant, then that is extremely um, difficult for it to adapt to because it can't move um, the entire length of San Jose State's campus in 23.3 days. So this is, this is a uh, chart that shows the maximum speed at which various species of plants and animals can move, can migrate to um, 
move with to basically stay at the same temperature. And so we have uh, trees. And so the, you know, the fact that trees are on here at all means that it's not the tree itself that's you know, uprooting and walking and going to a new place. It's the idea that like some trees with quick uh, generational lifetimes, they have seeds and there's a new tree growing uh, quickly. Those, the entire forest can move uh, with the temperature. Um, but so this is showing that the, the speed with which trees can move, or I guess forests, not trees themselves, can move is from about zero to 15 kilometers uh, per decade. So if we look back at our map here, so zero is obviously off this chart and then up to 15 kilometers per decade. So some very fast growing, like if you're talking about like bamboo or something like that, that that entire thing could potentially move uh, with temperature fast enough. Um, and then obviously mobile animals um, can potentially move faster. Um, and then these other, you know, so we have rodents, primates, these are things that aren't necessarily going to be able to move as fast. And so we're showing here that under RCP 8.5 and RCP 6, which are these kind of higher, or RCP 8.5 is a higher level emission scenario here and RCP6 is kind of what we think we are going to end up with by 2100 under current policies. Uh, those are beyond the capacity of rodents and primates and uh, herbaceous plants and trees. They're beyond the capacity of those things to migrate. And so that would be very bad uh, for those uh, things. So that's kind of a direct impact of temperature um, change. You know, instead of just thinking about the global average temperature, like what does that mean? Here's what it means. It, it means that um, at the local level, you're going to have temperature changes that are large enough so that ecosystems can't move fast enough to migrate to stay at the same climate. Um, another way of looking at this is something, this was research that came out uh, last year, and you can explore this in more detail at this uh, URL. And what this has done is they've looked at all the cities um, in the US, and they've looked at what the climate of that city um, will look like in the future by comparing it to a city that exists now. So an example of that would be if you take uh, Madison, Wisconsin, which is where I went to college. Um, it says the climate similarity map shows how similar today's climates are to 2080s climates in Madison, assuming high emissions. The line indicates the location with highest similarity. So what this is saying is that the climate today in Kansas City will be like what the climate in Madison will be tomorrow or not tomorrow but you know 20 2080s so for new york for example um i guess i didn't do the new york one i did washington dc so washington dc for example in the 2080s will be much more like um mississippi is today and then mississippi today will be much more will be you know Kind of off the charts in terms of the United States anyway. So that's a, you know, that's a big deal because there's very different, um, you know, terrestrial ecosystems in these locations. And so moving Washington DC to essentially Mississippi climate wise by the 2080s is very disruptive and it's uh, makes, you know, makes a big difference. Another way in which it's important to think about temperature change in terms of its impacts on things is to not just think about the average temperature, but to think about how the average temperature manifests itself in terms of heat waves and cold spells. So in order to think about this, we have to think about not just 
the global average temperature, or not just the average temperature at any given location, but the distribution of temperature in terms of how frequently you get temperatures at various values. So we usually think about this like a uh, histogram chart or what you'll sometimes hear is like a bell curve or a Gaussian curve where you have frequency, how often something happens on the y-axis and then your temperature values on the x-axis or, you know, this could be, you know, grades in the class and how many people got a given grade, you know, something like that. Um, but here we'll talk about temperature. So colder over here and warmer over here. And so this would be like what the original climate say at some location looks like. So they generally do tend to look like bell curves like this, where you have most of your temperatures are near the average temperature. And then you have some very cold extremes, but that doesn't happen very frequently, very frequently. And you have some very warm extremes, but that doesn't happen very frequently. And then as the climate gets warmer, we know that the average temperature, which would be this dotted line, that has to get warmer, right? So you think about like a warmed climate, the kind of baseline assumption would just be that the shape of the distribution stays the same, but the entire climate just gets warmer. And so that would be a situation where you have, if you look at these extremes, you have way less cold extremes and you have way more warm extremes. So you would have more heat waves and less cold spells, we call them. So warming with more extremes in the warm side and less extremes uh, in the cold side. But you could imagine a situation where it doesn't have to be so simple. So you could have a situation where you get warming in the average, right? So you get the same warmed uh, change in your mean, but you also have more cold extremes as well, or more cold spells. So you would have warming with more warm extremes and more cold extremes, where extremes here I'm talking about are like these tails of the uh, distribution. Um, and you could also have the other type of situation where you have warming with less warm extremes and less cold extremes. So if I put the original, original climate on here in both cases, can you in your head picture how this distribution would look in a warmed climate if you had more warm extremes and more cold extremes? So see if you can just imagine like what the shape of this thing is going to look like once I put this on here. If I get more warm extremes and more cold extremes in a warmed climate. So to get more warm extremes, it's going to have to be, it's going to have to look like this, right? Where the new climate has more. And when I say more, I mean the y-axis is higher because it's highly higher daily frequency. So more warm extremes. And then also to get more cold extremes, it's going to have to be higher over here. And so in order to do that, I have to suppress it in the middle. It has to be flatter in the middle. So it looks something like this, where it's warmer on average and you get way more hot extremes, you get way more of these heat waves uh, and you get more cold extremes as well. So that would be one possibility. This is just a hypothetical uh, change. And this is something that you'll hear a lot about it, that when there's a cold extreme, a lot of times you'll hear someone claim that that was actually due to global warming as well, because we expect as it gets warmer to see more extremes in both directions. So that's something um, that you'll hear. And so that would be like a hypothetical change that would be a possibility. And then what about this? Warming with less warm extremes and less cold extremes. So that's kind of interesting. Like you could, you could imagine a situation where the average gets warmer, but you actually see less of those really, really hot days. And so that would look something like this, where it's the same amount of warming, but that distribution is compressed so that you actually have less of these really, really hot days and less, much less of the very cold days. So that would be kind of the other, the other uh, situation. So um, how about type in your, message box, your Zoom box here, which of these, A, B, or C, 
do you think is happening for us under current global warming? Is it basically that we're warming, but the distribution is staying the same, so we get more warm, really warm days and less really cold days? Is it warming, but we get way more really warm days and we also get more cold days? Or is it warming and we get less really warm days and less really cold days? So I'll just show you some, some actual uh, data for that. So this is, uh, these are a couple, a couple measures of extreme. So extreme heat is on the top and extreme cold is on the bottom. Um, and this is for, this is like looking over global land. And it's basically what this measure is, it's called TX90P. Um, and T1090P, these are percentiles, these are changes in the 90th percentile and changes in the 10th percentile. But it's basically the global average number of days per year that are very warm and the global average number of days per year that are very cold uh, for a given place. And so what we're seeing is that the, very, that the days that are very warm are increasing, right? That's to be expected. Um, and, but the days that are really cold are decreasing. So we're not seeing this change in cold days increasing. We're seeing change in cold days decreasing. And this is showing the same thing in, in terms of a map where we have, this is another kind of measure of very cold days. This is, this is called the cold spell duration index, CSDI. And this is the warm spell duration index. So we're looking just on those tails of the distribution, just the extreme colds and the extreme uh, warming. And this, let's look at our, our legend here. These are all negative values. So we don't have any positive values. So these negative values mean a reduction in cold days. So as it's getting warmer, we're seeing over the entire globe that the cold, the very coldest days are less frequent. We're seeing less of those very cold days. And then on this one, we're seeing much more of the warm, warmest days. So our warm spell duration days are all increasing. These are all positive values. So really what we're seeing when we look at the data, when we carefully analyze, and this comes from the, all those instruments all around the surface of the planet, the thermometers, um, we are actually seeing cold spells decreasing while heat waves are increasing. And that's essentially the case um, all over the planet. So this is, I mean, this is still like an active area of research and there's um, still papers coming out discussing, you know, you might, you may have heard the term the polar vortex. Uh, and so how changes in, in global warming might affect the jet stream and might in some certain circumstances, uh, allow it to get colder over New York or, or over uh, the Eastern United States in some cases. But really, when we look at the data, we see decreases in very cold days, decreases in their frequency and decreases in their intensity, not increases in cold as it's getting warmer. Um, so here's another, or I'll skip that one. Here, here's another measure of that. So frost days, this is days how many days of the year when you're below zero degrees Celsius or 32 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. And we again see no locations globally where we see an increase in frost days. All the locations are seeing a decrease in frost days as it's getting warmer. Or this is actually projections from models, but um, the point remains the same. And then looking at, again, the this is the the uh, tails of the distribution, the warmest and coldest days. So our warmest daily maximum temperature in terms of how that's changing uh, in temperature, we see it warming everywhere. And then here's, here's that key thing, the coldest daily minimum temperature warming everywhere as well. So if, if we were expecting to see colder days get colder and warmer days get warmer as greenhouse gases increased, then we would think that this coldest daily minimum temperature would actually be colder, but no, it's all getting warmer. So going back to our options of A, B, C, 
it's actually much more like this is what we're seeing um, when we actually analyze the data. So be careful about uh, news that says that uh, as we increase greenhouse gases, things just get more extreme in all directions and everything is crazier and it's global weirding. Um, that would be something that, that you'll hear in some headlines. Uh, we, that's not actually what we see in the data. We actually see that cold extremes are getting less frequent and warm extremes are getting more frequent. And we're not seeing this phenomenon of getting more cold extremes as it gets warmer. So the last thing that I'll talk about in terms of temperature extremes, and this will be our last thing today, is this notion of return period and return value. So these are uh, important concepts for thinking about extremes in warm temperature. So we're not going to really be talking about you know, problems with extremes in cold temperature increasing because they're not increasing. So we're, we're going to be more shifting to problems of extremes in warm temperature uh, increasing because that's where a lot of the impact of climate change comes from, right? It's like if you have a day that's 120 degrees Fahrenheit, that could kill all of your crops and then you have no crops for that whole year. Where if it was just a little bit less, maybe you're, you know, you would have 50% of your crops saved and that would be a much smaller impact. So we care a lot about these extremes and that's where a lot of the impacts uh, come from. So this return period and return value are uh, useful ways of thinking about these. So. Um, I'll show you what these are. So on here we have uh, temperature on the y-axis again. So we're thinking about like extremes in temperature. So let's say 105 through 120 degrees Fahrenheit. So pretty hot temperatures. And then to quantify the return period or the return value, um, on this axis we have this frequency, which we call the return period. And we quantify this or we, we, yeah, we quantify it with these values of like once every one year, once every decade, once every century, once every millennia. And so you, if you look at like the current climate in some location, you could draw a line something like this. And so what this says is that, okay, once every year, we expect to see a temperature of about 108 degrees Fahrenheit at this location. Um, and then it sometimes gets hotter than that. So at, at about 113 degrees Fahrenheit, that happens, but it only happens once every about decade, right? And then if the climate was stable, we would have a situation where we would expect to see a 117 degree Fahrenheit temperature about once every century. So once every 100 years, we would expect to see, um, maybe we can put that at 120, 118 maybe. So once every 100 years, we would expect to see an 118 degree Fahrenheit temperature. And then once every millennium, we would expect to see about 120 something. And then as the climate gets warmer, this entire line shifts up. So everything warms, it goes warmer on the y-axis here. So that would be, that would, if we just take like one of these uh, frequencies, we can see how this would work. So once every one year temperature. So once a year in the previous climate, we expected to see a temperature of about 107 degrees Fahrenheit. But in this new warmer climate that we're talking about, like in the future, we would expect to see um, that one per year temperature increase. So it becomes, you know, 115 degrees Fahrenheit instead of 107, say. And then the other way to look at that is this uh, change in the return period. So previously, we might say at this location, uh, 
you know, we expected to see a 115 degree temperature once every decade, but that has now shifted so that it becomes once per year. So we used to only see 115 degrees Fahrenheit once per decade. Now we see 115 degrees Fahrenheit once every single year. So it's 10 times more likely to occur. And then as I was just talking about, that change in the once per decade value goes up as well. So this, this change in the horizontal, that's a return period shift. So that's the return period shift for 115 degrees Fahrenheit. It shifted from once per decade to once per year. And then this other part is the return value shift. So the return value are these temperatures. And so that went up by about five degrees uh, as well. So that these return periods and return values are used to look at changes in extremes in temperature. And so here is an example of a return value shift uh, for daily maximum temperatures. And this is a, uh, this is a projection into the future. Um, but yeah, they're showing like at the end of the century, our climate models are showing something like nine degree changes, which are closer to like, you know, 18 degree Fahrenheit shifts in the return value of the warmest daily maximum temperature. So warmest daily maximum temperature would be this once per year value. So once per year value is going up in this um, projection for the end of the century to it's almost increasing by like 18 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's this huge kind of nonlinear extreme change in the most extreme warm and warm temperatures, uh, which means that you have kind of disproportionate impacts from the extremes getting way more likely uh, to occur. So that is, those are the main, those are the main uh, key things to think about in terms of kind of converting, moving from this global average temperature notion into temperature impacts at the local scale. It's thinking about how uh, you have to convert a global average temperature in degrees Celsius to a change in degrees Fahrenheit and how that affects uh, ecosystems and how fast they'd have to move. So that's our velocity. And then how that ex affects extremes in temperature, uh, and in particular, how um, you know, the most extreme warming events become much more likely as you shift that uh, distribution here to the right.